straight from Silicon Valley. Three generations of venture capitalists and one guest judge equals Meet the Dreamers! Imagine that, they wanted another season. Entrepreneurs pitch billion dollars lost every year. We were both wandering aimlessly. The judges ask the questions. So what's special about you guys? We're able to stay on your platform. But here is the twist. You, the viewers, get to invest for equity. This is your chance to own a piece of the next big idea. To invest in a company, go to meetthedrapers.com, find them in this week's Entrepreneurs, and you can invest. You can share in their future success. At the end of the season, the entrepreneurs with the most funds raised are brought back for the season finale, where Tim Draper invests in his favorite company. Become an entrepreneur because it's easy to get money, and that didn't happen in Wall Street. Let the games begin. Welcome to Meet the Drapers. I'm Jesse Draper, this is my dad, Tim Draper. And today is Andy Tang, world-renowned venture capitalist. First day on the show, I'm so excited. Andy is a world-renowned venture capitalist. He works at Draper Associates and he's also CEO of Draper University. And today we also would like to welcome back Rajiv Madhavan, founder of Clear Ventures, our guest judge who did so incredibly last season that we brought him back. Happy to be here. I can't believe I'm amongst such just incredible VCs right now. I'm feeling a little starstruck. Well, you're one of them. Thanks, Dad, but you're my dad. It really doesn't count when you say that. But thank you so much. Oh my gosh, So incredible. we were wondering, what do you all think about when you're hiring somebody? Co-founders, how do you, how do you partners. choose a partner? How do you choose staff members? How do you do it? In a startup environment, especially when you're hiring so many people, you have to be very careful. It's a family, but it's a professional family that you're building. It's a marriage. I mean, you're together 30, 40, 50 years. I used to feel like if you were dating or married, it was a non-issue. But now, recently, I've had some interesting situations. We just had a, a falling out of a boyfriend-girlfriend co-founder, which is pretty brutal. And yeah. then someone suing the company. I mean, oh, I, goodness. I thought I told you about that. <laughs> but, the boyfriend, girlfriend. But I had to learn it myself. There's a lot of... <laughs> yeah. But I had to learn so it myself. <laughs> See, the, there's so much pressure in a startup... But there's so many successes, that if they're, too. And if they're boyfriend and girlfriend, it's, you know, 98 times out of 100, they're going to break up because there's too much pressure. And, and boyfriend, uh, girlfriend, even husband's uh, wife teams, for an investor, it's very difficult. We just recently passed on a company where the market was great, but the engineer, engineering VP, who was the husband, was not strong. But how do we convey this to, yeah. to the, uh, to the yeah. wife, the who's the CEO? Right. It's very important to get somebody who's, who's different enough from you so that they fill in gaps that you might or might, might not have. And I know I am not a great operational person. And no. Andy Tang <laughs> is a great operational person. And he manages all the people and gets them kind of marching in the right direction. While I can go out and like get on a TV show like Meet the Drapers. <laughs> on a day like today. On a day like today. <laughs> oh wait, who's watching the shop? Oh no. <laughs> what I noticed is that when we, we looked at uh, a bunch of our Chinese investments, we looked for co-founders, two to three of them. Inevitably, over time, we take that model to China one by one they will leave and you have one man standing. So then we wised up and we said, well, for stability, we're gonna start with a team, but there's clearly one person in charge. For good or for bad, at least you're taking a, a, a yeah. path. One thing I'm looking for when there are two entrepreneurs in the room, if they start talking over yeah. each other, I realize that there's a leadership crisis right. and they've gotta get over that before they come back and right. talk to us again. Let's hear what the entrepreneurs have to say. We could go on forever Yeah, about I'm this. excited to see, we're, we're all gonna dissect the co-founders a lot today, I'm sure. Yeah. Let's bring out the entrepreneur, but first, let's take a look at what's going on behind the scenes. Hi, I'm Lin Dai. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Tapcoin by Hooch. I'm Jared, I'm the co-founder and CMO. 
Our company caters to what I call a couch economy. Everything's convenient, but you're sitting on your couch ordering everything to be delivered to you. There's a huge implication to the advertising industry where uh, we provide a decentralized system for brands to connect with consumers. I just took my last company public, and next thing you know, I'm telling my wife on our honeymoon that I was going to quit my public company CMO job to focus on this little new app that we're building. Being part of our app ecosystem, we can drive uh, a lot of great young professional and millennial audience to your venue. So we think this is a billion dollar idea. Hi, I'm Lin Dai. I'm Jared. Apps today cater to what I call a couch economy. You sit on your couch and order everything to be delivered to you. But humans are innately social animals. We crave that connection in the real world. And that is why millennials care more about experiences than products. The Hooch app offers perks at over 100,000 restaurants, hotels, and bars. From free drinks to up to 60% off Expedia hotel rates in any major city worldwide. Consumers pay a subscription fee or they can opt in to share their purchase data with us in order to access these perks. We already have 200,000 users and we're doing over 2 million in annual revenue. TapCoin by Hooch is a blockchain token that takes the experiences to another level. Consumers connect their credit card and let us verify their purchases and we reward them back with 5 to 10% of their purchases in the form of TapCoin. TapCoin can be earned just like credit card rewards point, except at five to 10 times faster speed and can be redeemed for free drinks, dining, and future hotel bookings. Now, unlike centralized advertising platforms like Facebook, which takes 100% of advertisers' dollars and maybe one in a thousand people clicks on an ad, Tap allows consumers to directly monetize their own purchase data for the first time. We remove any personal identifiable information and encrypt your purchase data on a permission blockchain. So in order to access your data, brands pay you directly, TapCoin into your wallet in order to encourage you to make a purchase or take some action, which essentially allows brands to create millions of targeted micro advertising campaigns on a one-to-one -one basis directly with consumers, which is a truly decentralized advertising platform. Your two million in revenue, uh, is that revenue to you? In the last two years, we operated on a subscription model and a sponsorship model. So those are all um, net revenue to so us. It's, but, but that two million is, is a revenue, I mean, is huge different from TapCoin? I mean, TapCoin is an ICO, so you sort of have two entities going on here, if I'm not mistaken. Tap is a subsidiary of Hooch um, that is um, launching a token, and the token will be reward used to reward consumers. So how did you get into 100,000 locations. We, we knocked on a lot of doors. No, but you couldn't have physically done that. So how did you do that? Um, so we got introductions and networked our way to kind of the, 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 the top C-level people at the top hotel companies. So, and how, are, how much are they paying subscription? So there's two tiers of subscription. So there is um, $10 a month um, if you want to receive one free drink every day at you know top bars and lounges around the world. And uh, the second tier is um, a $295 a year, which is about $25 a month. And then you get access to um, hotel booking, um, restaurant reservation. How do you guarantee <clears throat> the availability of, let's say $10 subscription? I, I bought one for $10. How do you make sure that there's enough drinks for that $10? The concept is uh, we work with hospitality uh, venues from hotel to restaurant to bar to drive customer to their place. If you bring thousand people and ask me to give free drinks every day, that's not that, gonna work. So how do you make sure that there is enough supply on that site? Interestingly, so a, a drink is one of the um, highest markup items. What we are providing is filling the empty bar stove. So res restaurants and bars are happy to give away $1 worth of product to, to drive another $30 to $40 in, in revenues. And you said you had two, <coughs> how many customers? Two About 200,000 users. Are all subscribers? Um, no, so either they subscribe pay with a paying subscription or they share their um, purchase data with us. How many paid subscribers? Uh, about about 20%. Keep the coin aside. Mm -hmm. What's the value of the application? And if you're doing coin, 
then wouldn't it be better to, to use that coin as an infrastructure so a lot of the others who are providing these loyalties and coupons can connect to you and you become the kind of way and method of, of doing that? Two parts of the question. So um, the on the coin side, we're really, we are building an SDK. So this is meant to go into more than just the Hooch app. So we're talking to other um, top hospitality groups where rewarding consumer behavior is important. The um, consumer reward side, we look at millennial behaviors and the experiences they care about is travel, um, dining, um, going out to bars, and events and concerts. These four categories are actually the highest margin businesses, and then they have a time-based depreciating asset, right? So if they don't sell that room, or if they don't sell that ticket, or if they don't sell that bar seat today, that revenue opportunity is gone. There are like, I don't know, 800 competitors doing exactly the same thing. How is it that you guys have figured out how to actually make money doing it? Generally, people are tied to brands. Maybe, maybe that's your key, is that you're not tied to any one brand. Right. Because, so because the Starbucks points are not going to go with the United points, but they all might take tap. Yeah, I'm a loyalty program um, nerd, right? So there's just a lot of problems with traditional royalty programs. Points are not transferable, and then even within the same pro points, if I'm a, have Delta Sky Miles and you know I need to transfer 10,000 uh, miles to my wife's account, um, you know I get charged $200 fee to do that. So it's <laughs> uh, it's really um, you know like unfair to the consumers. So what's your customer acquisition cost in this um, particular case? Our, on, on the subscription side, our customer acquisition cost is, is on average around uh, blended average about $18. 18 so, per consumer? Per, uh, per paid subscriber. But I thought it's all word of mouth, so I would have thought it's much lower. How so, exactly, what is that $18 going to? Um, you know, different marketing channels. We do a little bit of Facebook um, campaign and, um, and we do um, a lot of PR around yeah. this. So people like to talk about getting free hotel rooms and mm. free drinks and press love to talk about that. Tell us about you two. Uh, what's your background? Are you CEO? Uh, yeah, I'm CEO. Uh, we're, we're both nerds. Uh, so I graduated from Carnegie Mellon University and, you know, double major CS and business and, and um, ended up building my first company out of my dorm. Learned a lot on the first dot-com boom. Joined a mobile video startup in Canada five years ago and up taking that um, public. It's history. And how about you? Yeah, I, I've been doing ad tech since I was 14 or 15. Uh, and started a company with some friends from high school uh, directly out of college that we grew to uh, close to 100 million annual revenue. Uh, and then I exited that about three years ago and connected with this guy. But you started the company and you hired him? We kind of co-founded at the same time. Oh, and what's your role in the company? CMO. Well, thank you very much yeah, for coming thanks, to meet guys. the Drapers. Thank you very much. Great. Yes. Absolutely, thank you Terrific. for What's up, guys? Hey. How's it going? Hey. How are you guys? How's it going? Oh, man, it was uh, intense. It was, it was a blur. Was, everything happened so quick, so it was kind of intense. Uh, we got it done. You know, it's kind of intimidating the presence of, like, you know, Tim Draper and other VCs. Kind of similar to what we expect from talking to VCs in the past. To know user retention and yeah. churn and all that. I think, did you feel it was, like, really short? Like, you know, I feel like there's so much we could talk about this for another hour. I feel like we were just getting started, and then we got cut off. Raji would really want to appreciate a cocktail and Jesse from this one right now. I think Rajiv and Jesse would love to probably had a margarita as we were talking. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, break a leg. If you are watching, um, please support us and invest in the Tapcoin project. You can earn 10% back at any of the top hotels, restaurants, bars you frequent. It is going to democratize and decentralize both advertising and hospitality. I can't wait to discuss this one with my fellow judges. So what do you guys think? Uh, I don't know, I, th I think it's it's good that they have some financial traction. Yeah. But I just feel like it's uber competitive and it's yeah. uh, almost like a race to the bottom. You're just- How did he grow to 40,000? What is his growth pattern? All of that was not very clear, but that is his, his asset. If you take it at its word, he's 
paying $18 and he's getting $10 a month and the, the user is getting a free drink for each of that $10 and he's not paying for that $10. Right. There's something interesting here yeah. and we're yeah. missing what it is. But and I think we need to talk to some millennials who have signed up for it and figure actually, out what that is. I'm actually on the millennial cusp in these things. <laughs> Here's the issue. <laughs> the, the stickiness thing is not there. Like I wouldn't sign up for this personally, but if I did or my friends did, you leave your credit card um, hooked up to it for about three months till you realize, oh, I don't really use this right. thing. It's like, I don't so, need this. So the Rajiv is, asked is, about churn and he didn't say anything about churn. Right. didn't say anything. But I would sign up if you came up with another app also, because that yeah. also gives me another drink right. for free, right? <laughs> right, you want the free drink, but you don't want to pay for the free drink. So clearly there's value in, in, in that aspects of things, but you know, for a token to become a centralized token to be used by lots of applications is a, is a, is a tough thing. Yeah, he didn't really talk about a token. I feel like that yeah. that is almost just the flavor of the month. So let's yeah. just tokenize this. Now, to his defense, tokens always are another thing. You've got your business and then you've got your token. The thing he they did was they they broke the brand thing. All the other ones that I've seen are all tied to a, to the various brands, and then they're trying to make all those brands talk nice to each other, like, Starbucks, please take United Miles. Yeah, I don't know. We're missing a lot of pieces here. I think that's, that's I right. Well, like. so then we have to consult the crystal ball. Okay. Tap the crystal ball for <laughs> hooch. What happens if I touch the crystal ball? No, no, you can't touch it. Ow! <laughs> I warned you. Dating, Dad, no. let me learn for myself. Okay, go ahead. Touch okay. the crystal ball. See what <laughs> happens. <laughs> okay, I got mine. Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs all around. I feel there may be something that I'm missing. That's the problem, unfortunately, on this. That's our two cents, but it's up to you. You can invest or you can buy the coin. Go check it out on meetthedrapers.com. Before we continue, We'd like to do something special. We are gonna go back across the street to Draper University. We showed the Draper University students one of the hitches that, and we're gonna see what they think. Hi, I'm Courtney. Hi, I'm Gabriel. Hi, I'm Hira. So, do you guys think there is an art to pitching? I think uh, the only art of pitching is to, to make the audience feel that how much passionate you're about your idea and the energy that you have to make it happen. Yeah, pitching is definitely a skill. It's lots and lots of practice, but there's definitely an art to it. It's got to be a performance. You've got to show your investors that you love what you're doing, you love your idea, and you have the vision to carry it out. you got to get them excited and engaged. Welcome to Meet the Drapers. So give us your pitch. Um, my name is Amrita. Nice to meet you guys. Hi, I'm Malika, and we are the founders of, of Pure, Pure Makana. Makana. Uh, before we talk about our product, I just wanted to give you a little story. I was applying to get into a grad school and I was working non-stop. That stress was reflected in all the food choices I was making around that time. Popcorn, potato chips, pretzels. Everything that I thought would taste good and make me feel full was making me feel bloated and guilty. But then one day, made some snacks with makana or popped boralidi seeds, something that I grew up with. I made it for my family and friends, and that's how the idea for Pure Makana was born. So the first time I tried Makana or popped water lily seeds, I was completely hooked, and I really wanted more Americans to try this versatile seed. It's a gluten, grain, and dairy-free seed, making it perfect for people following a vegan or paleo diet. It has an anti-aging enzyme, and it also has a low glycemic index, so it's great for people that have diabetes that want something to snack on. Scientific studies have also shown that... Hang on, it's got a, something that does anti-aging? How do we know that? There have been numerous studies done on the popped water lily seed itself, and it has a presence of uh, camphorol, which is known to reduce inflammation. So I this is a fountain of youth. It is. This is a fountain of youth, yeah. <laughs> so what's your business? So we are actually serving snacks by roasting oven roasting makana with simple, clean, organic ingredients. I think they took a little long to get to the business. Roast. Yeah, I want to know what they actually do. I think they kind of went over their problem, but what do you do? Yeah, it's a little run on. And also I think the, the, the seed that they're talking about, it, it exists in the market already. Okay. So they need to I mean, just show what exactly they are doing with that particular seed to solve it, any problem. 90% uh, of the world's 
Water lily seeds or makhana come from the northeastern state of Bihar in India. As we scale, we hope to build relationships with farmers directly. Now, have you thought about how how much more of that seed people are going to have to produce than they do today? We know that the government back in Bihar is actually promoting more agricultural uh, communities to be part of this new plant because it's actually also becoming famous back in India as we speak. I don't like that she doesn't have like the actual numbers yeah. for us. Yes. It's kind of scaring me. Yeah, I think, you know, you've got to know what your market is, especially since this is such a niche product. Yeah. I think they're kind of missing that yes, story. Yes, I, I think I feel exactly the same, yes. Could you do it in the U.S.? So because uh, in U.S., just like we cannot grow bananas in U.S. Right. because of we the couldn't temperature. Right, we bring it here. Exactly. So for what we were thinking, in order to have a better control on the quality and the entire supply chain, what we would try to do eventually once we have the scale is get the whole seeds imported to U.S. and pop them here instead of back in India, okay. just so that we have a better control on the, the temperature and the cleanliness in with which all the process takes yeah. place. And, so yeah. the, the entire numbers or the justification of the pitch with the numbers is missing from the entire presentation. Yeah. yeah, they're missing a lot of quantitative data. Yes. Right, so we can't actually make a decision. You know, we're going off of what they feel. It's a lot of we feel, yes. we think. We so, yeah. yeah, I think they're underselling themselves. They yeah. sound like they've had talked yes. to a lot of customers, but is that 10 or is that thousands? Right. That makes yes. a big difference. And mm -hmm. so um, by not giving us those numbers, we kind of miss the sale of the pitch. Mm -hmm. I'm not very excited about it. Yeah. Who's the CEO? Uh, I'm Malika. the CEO. And so, what's your background or why are you qualified to do this? I am originally from New Delhi where I grew up with these seeds. Um, I have an undergrad degree in statistics and I did my economics degree. Yeah. At statistics Cambridge. where are numbers? <laughs> <laughs> and until last year I was working as ASEAN economist for Goldman Sachs in Singapore before I moved here. I am a foodie at heart. Yeah. Have you managed food. people before? No, not directly under with so me, but we have had this opportunity of interacting with other people. And and, and what's your background? And what's your job? I am the COO and I currently work as a purchaser um, in the retail space. I have managed a team of people managing inventory. I mean, I like the whole trend of um, healthier snacks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, seaweed is something that you know, I ate as a kid in Asia. I think it's sort of becoming more popular in the U.S. So I, th I see there's a trend. But I'm curious, how do you know if consumer would like this taste? We've been engaging with a, uh, with a lot of customers and doing weekly customer demos. And the feedback that we've gotten is that it's light, crunchy, and airy, reminiscent of popcorn. So Maybe we should taste it, Andy. <laughs> what yeah. a great idea. Absolutely. Maybe we should oh, try it. Oh, did we get a chance to try it? So the white one is a pink salt one. Oh, that's fun. And the oh, orange one is fun. a tangy chili. Wow, it's these like are pop. great. It's really good. Yeah. I would definitely mm. eat these. Mm, me too. A little spicy. In fact, spicy. I feel like we need to be watching a movie or something. <laughs> you, I, can, I can feel myself getting younger. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> if you roast it, does it still make you younger? Wait, yeah, do you sorry. lose your wisdom? <laughs> I kind of want my wisdom and become, like, the youthful wow, body. Wow. What are the costs of a bag and then what are you going to sell it for? Given that we are on a much smaller scale right now, we are incurring a lot of costs per bag. But once we have direct relationship with the farmers back in India, we estimate it to go down for a $5 bag for an ounce, it should go down to $1 to $1.25. It seems like they're kind of basing everything on hopefuls at yes. this point. I, I heard her mention like we hope to partner or build relationships and they're not actively working to build those relationships right now. There seems to be a lot of assumptions. I mean, I don't know a lot about the seed market, but there's a lot of I hope, which yeah. I'm glad they're hopeful, <laughs> but I would like to see some tangible numbers here. Yeah, and, and also I think the, the, the exact market need that they have found mm -hmm. with their seed, that's, that number is missing. But right now, what are, your, what are your costs per bag? It's close to $4. So why don't you just charge more for the bag? Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the aspects that we yeah. will also be testing, given that it's a premium product. What are the limits or the elasticities of price that we can test our consumers on? This really is really tasty. It's really good. It's really tasty. Yeah, yeah so, I, I would do it's this. It's certainly better than popcorn. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned you're only planning on getting them into cafes and shops. I think today, as a brand, you have to have a direct-to-consumer. What are you thinking in terms oh, of... Oh, absolutely. absolutely. So we have these orders, but we are trying to put them on hold because we're still conducting our customer research. Great customer research would be sell to the customer. Right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like the turn away the customer yes, approach. Yes, yeah. And we need to figure out, we have a hypothesis in our mind about what this customer looks like, but we need to be even more hyper-specific so that we can identify those unique channels of distribution before we start our marketing and go for a full-on sales push. Well, thank you so much for thank coming so to much. Drapers. Thank you so, so much. Oh, so nice to meet you. Great. Thanks. Yeah, nice meeting thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think the best part of the pitch was the samples. Yeah, um, those looked really yeah. good. It's always good, you know. <laughs> yes. um, you know, audience engagement, taste the product to at least yes. convince them that way. Yeah, and I think she did a good job explaining, you know, I can't find something that's healthy that I can munch on. Mm -hmm. I have a really stressful life. So I think she did a really good job kind of just like painting that picture. Yes, the, the introductory part, I think, and the part that where she mentioned that it's an, it's, it has an anti-aging anti quality. We all want to be a, a little younger. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Um, I think I would fix how the information is organized and the strategy to getting to each point. Three, two, one. Sorry guys. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks guys. And now back to today's episode. So let's see what our judges think. Rajiv, what do you think? The challenge is branding and getting out and pushing against the existing incumbent brand names. Right. So the challenge for this is how do I get all the health aisles to be thinking about me and get that branding established very quickly. Right, I completely agree. Also, they need to push some direct to consumer and create a brand because people yeah. are selling these things in whole new ways. Yeah, We always struggle with um, entrepreneurs being focused and having a big vision. So this is clearly very focused. What I, what I was hoping to see a little bit more is what's a roadmap 20 years from now, this is a whole healthy snacking you know, product line. Yeah, if it's the fountain of youth, this thing could get really big, but I'm not sure it is. <laughs> I'm feeling a you little younger, <laughs> but not particularly that much younger. But let's say it is. I'm not sure that economically it's going to work because water lilies take up a lot of land mm, yeah. and a lot of water. Mm -hmm. I also, I didn't feel like this was what they were meant to do with their lives. And that's what I'm always looking for. This is a really, really big time for food. We're having this whole food mm -hmm. reinvention. How can we be healthier? How can we really think about everything? I think it is, it's the right time for them to be selling something like this. Gosh, the crystal ball is gonna be confused. We need to uh, get the vibes and okay, we what sort are of go, we, What are we thinking, everyone? We're, no, it's not what we're thinking. Oh, it's what, what thinking, the crystal ball is sending, oh, to, sending us. It to us. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit tingly. My, Something. You know. <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs all around. I'm gonna go s slightly down. I wanna see where they're gonna go. I wanna watch them. I can be a customer and I can enjoy this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wanna see how I look tomorrow after <laughs> yeah. the anti age <laughs> Obviously. Today it might be thumbs down, but if they continue to develop and have a vision, I think I might go a thumbs right. up. Right. Lemons ripen early and pearls take a long time yeah. to cultivate. That's the way it works in yes. Venture Capital. Yes. Yeah. I'm Mark DeSantis, CEO and co-founder of Roadbotics. We assess roads with machine learning and a simple phone app. This is my third machine learning, deep learning company. So I went back to the people who had worked in my previous company and I said, I know this is gonna sound crazy, but would you guys like to do this all over again? I actually had the good fortune of seeing Tim Draper present in Vienna. He gave an incredible presentation about how a lot of technologies now are making a difference for cities and how the public sector is now an extraordinary opportunity for entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs like us. So when I saw that, I thought, wow, he's, he, he gets what we're doing. I mean, roads are a very important part of our society. We take it for granted. In other parts of the world where we're working, where you're in, say, not so much a developed country, but a developing country, roads are life or death. A good road is the difference between survival and, and or not. As boring as roads seem to be, <laughs> and, the, and maintaining roads, it's actually pretty exciting for us because we know we're making, making a difference. 
Welcome to Meet the Drapers. Give us your pitch. Well, I'm Mark DeSantis, CEO and co-founder of a company called Robotics. This beautiful picture is a picture of the Appian Way. It's a 2,000-year-old road built by the Romans. The Romans built a 50,000-mile road network that extended from Europe to North Africa to the Middle East. And one of the reasons that the roads, some of which are still used today, are so good is they inspected the heck out of the roads. And the way they inspected the roads, they had a chariot and they had a guy that sat on the back of a chariot called a lictor. And as the chariot would roll down a road like this, that person would make notes of thing, features on the road, problems that need to be fixed, and they'd give it to the local road crew to fix. That's exactly how we do it now. The only difference is it's not a chariot, it's a Ford F-150, but it's two or three engineers, drive a few feet, get out, make some notes, go a few feet, make some notes. We have 10 million centerline miles of road. There's a better way, and our better way is to use machine learning and a cell phone app. So what are they looking for? They're actually looking not for potholes. If you see a pothole, it's the end of the journey of that road. That's a dead or dying patient. There's about four dozen different distinct features on asphalt, concrete, and other road surfaces. We're looking for those features so that a small fix can be applied to prevent the incidence of a big fix later. How do we do it? We use a cell phone app. You put the cell phone in the windshield with the camera pointed forward, turn the guy on, it records everything it sees. As soon as it sees a cloud, the Wi-Fi goes up to the cloud, our magic box, isolates the road, assesses that road just like a pavement engineer would. I love this. Who puts the cell phone in their windshield so that they can spot all this stuff? Well, in Is some that... cases we'll collect it, so we'll just get in the car and drive around at a normal speed in a normal way. In other cases we've used the customer's vehicles. In Los Angeles we used the city's street sweepers and they and the cell phones hitched a ride on the windshield of the street sweepers. But who pays for it? This is the government that pays for this? The vast majority of our customers are towns, cities, counties. Let me just give you a few numbers. We spend a hundred billion dollars a year in the United States to maintain our road network. Globally it's a third of a trillion dollars to maintain just paved roads and paved roads are only 20% of all roads. But I worry the yep. government is not a rational customer. Who, who is the payer? In yeah, so, uh, who signs off? Is it a controller, is it a city manager? Uh, the US road network, about 6% are managed directly by the federal government. About 16 are actually DOTs. And then the other 78% or so, it's a local phenomenon. And in fact, the, we were nervous about a lot of things when we, tried, right. we said, my goodness, selling to the local government <laughs> must be hard. It's actually a really easy sell. The, the people with the shovel all yeah. the way up to the mayor love this product. I'm actually doing a press conference with the mayor of Savannah, one of our newer customers. He's so happy about this. One How's it going so far? What, what are your revenues? Are you so we are we money? are yep we are only 18 months old from birth to now. We've generated 400k in revenue. How um, much we, you're raising? We're raising two million, and we have half of that committed from our original investment seed round. And how big is the market? How much do we spend on? Surveying the roads. Surveying the road. It's it's an estimate, an industry estimates from the American Society for Civil Engineers and others put it around five percent of that spend. So just make it a rough figure of five billion. I think it's higher when you're driving down a road. If you just pause for a moment and look at that windshield, there are a dozen different assets. Somebody that's got a high skill, high paying job has to go look at and assess. Tell us about you, what's your background? So this is my third machine learning company. My last company, which I sold, was a, a power trading hedge fund. We had developed a machine learning platform to help people buy and sell wholesale power, spot power. Did the investors make money? Yep, they made money. I made a little bit of money. What are your expectations of valuations and what, what exactly are you doing for this one million raise? That, that, that so it's, it's a two million dollar raise of which we raised one okay. and our safe has a nine million dollar cap. I see. Okay. Why do you care about this? Why is this a thing for you? I used to work for the government. My passion has always been to public service, but I have a, another passion, which is entrepreneurship. So every entrepreneurial venture I've been involved in had a public angle to it. Actually, I think entrepreneurs do more for public service than public service. <laughs> than public service do. <laughs> yeah. But why did you end up using a cell phone? Because it's probably more costly than buying GoPros with the Wi-Fi or some LTE connections. The, the, those are available for about $90, if I'm not mistaken. We wanted to make it as ridiculously easy as possible for the customer to deploy this. We wanted to be able to go to the public sector and say, you don't have to buy anything. Who has an Android phone? How many patterns are you in your AI system are you kind of detecting out of this, right? So a pavement engineer uh, yeah. is trained to look for about four dozen distinct features. Okay. And they go by names like alligator cracks, block cracks, edge cracks, raveling. Each of those features tells you something either about the surface 
or actually the subsurface. You've all seen alligator cracks. The problem with the alligator crack is twofold. It's a tear in the surface. It's also indicative of a subsurface problem where the subsurface itself is collapsing. That is a problem that is very serious. You can drive over an alligator crack and it's as smooth a ride as you can imagine. If so you, you have, have alligator feel, cracks, yeah. what do you do? Fill it in with tar or what? Is there a simple solution to just get it? He has so one in his driveway. <laughs> there I are. do. I there are. actually are. Typically what you're trying to do when you see alligator cracks or edge cracks or similar such cracks is you can do a sealant. Can you identify and score yes. and say, what is the best, the highest priority fix that I need to do? So we use the scoring system as the U.S. national standard, which is something called PACER. And that standard basically has it in five buckets. If you saw the output of what we produce, it'd be a multicolored map. Each road is scored intersection to intersection, but that's unsatisfactory to the engineers. So you can actually click down and get a sub-meter score, and then you actually see the image of the feature that's causing that score. It is an unprecedented unprecedented level of transparency. Can you talk a little bit about your wow. intellectual property? I have and, and, to give credit to a gentleman named Christoph Mertz, who is our chief scientist and was a researcher at Carnegie Mellon in the robotics right. lab. And he had developed this basically with the intent of trying to improve road quality for the autonomous vehicles yeah. in an inexpensive way. Proud to say my colleagues are in DC right now accepting an award from the American Society for Civil Engineers. We won their annual award for the most innovative civil engineering technology in the United States for 2018. Terrific. Definitely. Thank you Thank so you. much for coming to meet the yeah. driver. Thank you. Hey, there he oh. is. Yeah. Hey. How was it? I, I never seen a pitch where a fight breaks out. In a pit. No, I'm kidding. I think it went okay. I got a positive feeling. I've done enough presentations to know I guess to say when I'm doing very badly, I know that. So I didn't do badly. They asked really good questions, and in fact, I learned a couple of things. You know, the folks asking me questions are professional people who answer, who ask a lot of questions of entrepreneurs. They're trying to get to the heart of the matter, and they're very good at it. What was one of those things that you learned? How are we going to scale this thing? Yeah. So how are we going to grow it? You know, I'm always pleasantly surprised when people are welcoming of the opportunity that we're pursuing, the public sector. Sometimes people are a little skittish, even amongst investors, when they think, well, you're selling to government. But I think in this instance, what was very pleasantly surprising was the fact they were receptive to, receptive to the idea of selling to the public sector. It was good. It was definitely worth doing. I'm glad I did. If you want better roads and you want a good investment, invest in us. This is going to be a big discussion, I can tell. So what do we all think? One of the fascinations for me is application of AI. We're going to be using AI for everything and anything. I think the idea has a lot of merit. And I think I he's a third time entrepreneur. He's a third time entrepreneur. Which Customer can work for him or against him. You know, the guy's bright. He's got a lot the of energy. The guy's bright. I'm always looking for opportunities where they, they bring new technology into something that's been done for years and years and years the same way over and over and over. And this, the great example is this road guy who sits and goes, oh, there's a rock out of place, you know? I mean, I, I really am I'm pretty positive except for one thing, which is I don't know the customer community, which is how does the cities pay? How does the others pay? But even so, there should be a way to make money. And they're local governments so that they don't, uh, they don't turn the screws on you. So his margins will probably continue to be strong and he'll be able to keep adding more and more services. Indeed. I'm not sure the market's as big as he said, said it is. I think it's a big market though. I mean, you look there at the government, yeah. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of roads. A lot of bad of, roads. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of bad roads. <laughs> yeah. The government is a bigger customer than all the Fortune 500 companies combined. Um, and the government- A million dollars per pothole? Uh, yeah, what do you say, a million and a half what? dollars? That's I gotta what get said. into that business. <laughs> this is a business where you're gonna, next stage of it will be autonomous fixing vehicles. So you feed the data from this, it automatically drives, pours whatever needs to be poured and fixes the stuff. Oh, it might end up doing that. Crazy. But, then, but then what's gonna happen is that you're gonna do this and every, all the roads are just gonna be pristine and everything's gonna be great. And then we're gonna be having vertical takeoff and landing, we'll never, we won't need the roads. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should consult the crystal ball. So, okay. the road body. Robotics, robotics. Robotics. What do you think? Uh, do you okay, it? I've got it. I think I got it too. Okay. 
All right. Ready, guys? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs all around. Okay, I only went three quarters because I, I do think we're going to have flying cars fairly soon, and I do always look 15 years out, and I think 15 years from now, right. we may not need the roads. But otherwise, winner all the way. Andy, how do you think it went today? Um, I thought it was great. Um, I, we finished strong. Yeah. Right? And I thought we had three very different companies. And they're all very inspiring, actually, if you, if you kind of look at why they started their business. All three founders are highly respected for why they started the business. Just because we don't invest in certain business, it doesn't mean that it's not a investable business. You know, different investors should have different criteria. I'm, I commend the three entrepreneurs. What they need to do is basically, you will find the right investors. You just need to go and, and do the work to find that right investors. They just need to follow their heart and keep going. Stop and always question, but keep going on the three roads. The two of the three groups that came in here were teams. We saw teams oh, of yeah. two. And I always like asking, well, who's the CEO? So that they kind of, either they squirm, which the two women did, or they or they're very clear as to who the CEO and who Which, is not the CEO. But Tim, this they're, is a problem with, and where I would love female mm -hmm. entrepreneurs to get a little more authoritative. If you had asked two male entrepreneurs, they would say, I'm the CEO. The, well, both of them would have been oh, oh, both of them would have <laughs> No, but, yeah. but this one, but, but the, the, that they, group, Even that, though they're they very agree. clear, sometimes they don't want to take that position. And they need to. If you're a woman entrepreneur, you need to understand that, that it's yeah. important to answer that question correctly. And it's a job issue. Yeah. Yeah. Whose job is this? Yeah. yeah, I think that's really good advice. There, yeah, there's a confidence thing with women and you know, you really do need to just own it. Actually, when I was out there, they, they said, um, can we take a picture? And I said, sure. And they felt ashamed showing the bags in the picture. And I said, no, milk it. Like, be shameless. Like, just, yeah. I said, look it's at the back of my phone. It has all of the brands of, that I work with. Like, you, you need to do that. And I think that is, for some reason, women don't flaunt it you know yeah. they should brag about what they're doing they're building a company and I actually in the startup see... world if you got it flaunt it exactly you have to yeah. <laughs> no one else is gonna do that do for that for you. you if you got it flaunt it guys yeah. if you got it flaunt it what's our entrepreneur dance of the day oh let's get up dance. and do it oh, whatever boy, it is dance ready go go <laughs> okay <laughs> all right thanks <laughs> See you next week on Meet, Meet the, the Drapers! Drapers! You know who would like these? Monet. Get it? Monet, the artist? The artist. Am I yeah. the, he painted water lilies? Oh. Am I like the only Oh one? my <laughs> god. Get it? God, are we slow, huh? <laughs> I get it. Right? We got it. <laughs> I can't believe you guys didn't get my Monet joke. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> we were really slow. I was so embarrassed. We were. We were so slow. <laughs> Monet, did I say it weird? No, you said it right. <laughs> and I just went there too. Yeah, really, Andy. <laughs> no <laughs> excuse. <laughs> Monet, like, I did. I looked at every single one of you. Was like, huh? Live long in blockchain.